Welcome back to the Great Men Podcast episode for the life of Caesar. Back with me is my esteemed colleague, Mr. Oscar Ortiz, and our first guest ever on this segment after a sabbatical, Mr. David Oldham. Welcome back. Hello. That was perfect. It's great. So it, it's it's funny because you both were guests so recently on uh, other shows with Wes and me, and so that kind of inspired uh, Oscar and I to start this back up, and we couldn't think of anybody better than to have you on, Oldham, especially because y'all's shows really are hits with people. People really love you guys, and so oh. you got to give the people what they want. <laughs> That's what Caesar would say. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. And, you know, I think that is a big part of this. And that's something I wanted to touch on. So those are the listeners who are watching YouTube. They'll, they can see that I have a little outline up here. It's not much. But um, those not on YouTube, I just have it here. The life of Julius Caesar. Caesar as a boy. Caesar as a student. Caesar crying at the achievements of Alexander, which Oscar brought up last time I spoke to him. Caesar as public man and giver of gifts to the public. Caesar as conqueror of Gaul with uh, Vercingetorix, there's your word for the day, prated about. Uh, <laughs> Caesar is the emperor, his death, revenge of Caesar, and his remaining works in divination. We might talk about some of this, we might not, but I guess my first question is, Oscar, Oscar, mm -hmm. Oscar, why did we start again? Why did we start anew? Why are we resurrected in a Dionysian, Easter, Christ-like way um, <laughs> with Caesar? Why, what is it about this lodestone of a man? Because I do feel like when I first started this podcast with you, there was Darius, there was Cambyses, and mm -hmm. I'm like, they, they're fine, but Caesar is the man we want to be talking about. Uh, yes, actually, uh, it, it is a question of mine, Alex, because uh, I've often wondered what it is about Caesar that um, makes him so popular among historians, uh, readers of history. Uh, I, I am not yet convinced myself. Perhaps you can convince me. Um, of what exactly it is in his character that makes him so great. He's, he's kind, of a, kind of a strange cipher to me. Uh, sometimes he's admirable, and other times I'm just not sure if he's just a, um, you know, your normal thug who has a, a gang of people who, who terrorize <laughs> others into uh, submission. So I'm actually eager to address those questions and, and get your thoughts and David's thoughts about it um, in regards to Caesar himself. Whoa, Oldham, Mr. Oldham, and yeah. welcome back, Mr. Oldham Esquire. Thank you. I, I wonder, you are our <laughs> resident Latinist, and the most famous quotes, of course, of Caesar, it's ever had two Brute, Caesar, uh, techne, Technon, are, you know, Vinny, Vitty, Vici, or Winnie, Witty, Wiki, as mm. classicists would mm -hmm. with us. And there's something about that imperfect, or could you, you know, define that for us? And because there's something in those words that I think expresses the magnanimity of Caesar as a force of nature, which is the beginning of my response and a question to you, to Oscar. Hmm. So uh, the quote itself, the Winnie Witty Wiki? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, it's, it's obviously like a very, a very sticking quote, like everybody everybody's come across it seen it before either in latin or in the english mm -hmm. um and, and can you define it for us can you translate it for us yeah literally uh just i came i saw i conquered Dang. right winnie wiki wiki yeah it's it's so simple and it's got three parts which is always a a great like way to hit a quote home when it's got those three parts but yeah it's it's i think that's why it's so sticking is that it is so simple like he summarized everything that he did directly with those three words well which which makes me wonder how much how much of caesar's fame um oldham is due to the fact that he's so quotable or is he quotable mm. because he's so famous uh I, again i'm not denying yeah. that caesar is a great human there are uh qualities and and just uh, characteristics of the man that are stunning for his own time um but i i'm still um uh, I guess I'm still wondering what part of his humanity is it that has made him so famous or, or does it change with every culture? Well, I think it's his ability to unify and to simplify. Those mm. three words carry so much meaning, mm. the deeds behind them. And uh, mm. something that Plutarch goes to, you know, goes out of his way to tell us is that Caesar 
was a fine student and could have been a great rhetorician and a great speaker like Cicero, mm -hmm. but that he made the decision to be a man of action, a man mm -hmm. of the sphere of Mercury, Dante would say. And <laughs> so when he uses words, mm -hmm. it, it's like he, he has the force of a comet behind what he says mm -hmm. and that he can just simplify his existence into then there was Caesar and this is what happened. <laughs> That's, I mean, I see why there's an entire religion around, you know, uh, around the place that he um, renovated to his will. And yeah, I, th I think that's part of it. Wherever he goes, he's the boss. He, mm -hmm. uh, and it, I don't, and I do understand that there is sort of a, an Italian mafia thug element to that, but he also is so public spirited. Mm -hmm. He gives so much back to the people as hard as he drove people that yes. it, it's, he led his people towards greatness and civic virtue while also embodying it himself. Mm -hmm. It, so much so that even his great crime seems small in comparison to what he gave. And I think that's why the public uh, became so enraged when they saw his mangled body after having been sort of um, uh, uh, just calm about his death at first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Certainly. Now, uh, the, uh, the growth towards that. So uh, we have... Uh, instances of Caesar when he's a young when he's a young man uh, we have him um, and I'm looking at your outline here Alex uh, we have him um, as you were pointing out um, going to school to become a rhetorician or to learn rhetoric uh, which seems to have been something that he chose for himself and, and it, it wasn't uh, out of compulsion that he had to do it um, and then uh, we have him returning to Rome uh, to engage in public action or more of the politics of the city. Uh, but I, I'm wondering where, in, in Plutarch, it isn't very clear if there is a moment in which he becomes the Caesar or uh, if it's something that just from an early age, he had always been the Caesar, right? Uh, there mm. is no clear changing point, if you will, like you would in, a, in another character, uh, there would come this realization that they're meant, meant for greatness, or maybe they would uh, take on a they would take on a cross that uh, perhaps they hadn't intended to at first. And now they've they found purpose and meaning in life. Uh, Caesar seems to just have been Caesar since the beginning. Yeah, and I would I would agree with that. And I think Plutarch tries to say that a couple times, where he says uh, with clauses like. So much was Caesar meant for greatness that this and this happened. I mean, the fact that he was abducted by pirates and they demanded 20, um, 20 talents of gold for him, he laughed in their face and said, you don't know who you have here, let's go get 50, and then chased them down <laughs> and crucified them afterwards after having told mm -hmm. them he was going to do that while they were holding him. He, there's just a consistency of character there with this. Was with this? this? Yeah. Was it with? I'm trying to remember where I read it. Was it with the 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 um, pirates that he he slit their throats? Though at least the ones that were nice to him, he slit their throats as like a, a kindness in a way, so they wouldn't have to suffer. Was that that was at that point? Uh, that'd be a fine thing to know. Um, but, well, that's, uh, yeah, that's. It's. I just found that point interesting as well because I don't know if that goes. I think it goes. I mean. It, says something about his character, but in an interesting way, too, um, that he would do that, you know? Right. Right. <laughs> and No, I mean, I'm just, I'm thinking about those Romans and Caesar now, but something I'm interested in asking you two in comparison to Caesar is that you two, and uh, this is something that Wes and I really talk, uh, focused on when I was talking to you guys last time, you focused on civic virtue from an intellectual domain, working in education. And so I guess two questions. To what extent do you define yourselves as men of the intellect or as men of action? Are you practical men or are you intellectual men? Uh, and to what extent do you see what you do as the same as what Caesar does? Um, because he's also very civically minded, very publicly minded, mm -hmm. but in, I would say, a seemingly different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, mm. Olden, would, would, you like, would you like to go first? I understand that you're practicing law now. Is that correct? <laughs> it is. I mean, I'm doing my best. I'm uh, doing a couple of things on the side outside of teaching, working part time for a lady who does criminal defense and uh, family law. Um, but yeah, that's, it's, it's, uh, it's exciting. It's, um, it's definitely a big part of exactly the question that Alex, you were just asking. Um, I'm, I'm trying to, to do that. I'm trying to be both. I, I, I really think that, you know, to, to be one of at least, you know, not that any of us are going to be, uh, you know, as noteworthy as, uh, Caesar or Cicero. Um, I, I definitely think that to come close that you have to be both intellectual and practical. You have to tie both into each other. Um, and that's what I'm trying to do with my certain career, uh, choices. Now I actually last week just turned in my formal letter of resignation that I'm teaching out the year, but. Oh, um, wow. Wow. Yeah. It was kind of intense. <laughs> Um, I, I was actually at an event this weekend and one of the other principals, I didn't send it to him, but he stopped me and he said, Oldham, I wanted to say, I I liked your, uh, I liked your letter. I agreed with it. And, you know, I talked about like the importance of not just separating yourself from the world, but tying yourself to it. And, you know, also the other issue of like teacher pay not being as high as it should, uh, versus the standard of living in Nashville, you know, absolutely. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely like an attempt to tie in both uh, a way to live, you know, in my city, but also, you know, using both the intellect and the active part to um, pursue an, an attempt at change um, where it needs to be. Yes, um, that that's interesting, uh, Oldham. It, it looks, of, at least from my reading of Plutarch's uh, Life of Caesar, it looks like Caesar himself didn't think that uh, one could pursue the full extent of the intellectual life if one Mm. wanted to live a life of action. So it seems like Caesar chose to be second best in the life of the intellect, which isn't a bad place to be. I mean, he's second best uh, in relation to to the first, which, you know, it's Cato or Cicero. These these were great men as well, uh, primarily Cicero. Cicero back. And he got Cicero back just fine. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, just and, just and Cicero, fine. you know, would eventually, uh, just so the listeners know, Cicero there is eventually um, has his, I believe, head and hands um, mm-hmm. um, nailed to the rostrum from which he gave his speeches to the Roman people, the yeah. rostrum being the prow of a ship from a defeated mm-hmm. people in battle. So really quite the savage image. And yes. so Cicero paid, paid quite dearly for his, uh, for his rhetoric. Cato also, of course, a suicide, though embodiment of civic virtue mm-hmm. by the account of Dante. So these Romans often had great lives and also, you know, rather, rather brutal ends. Rather brutal yeah. ends. But I want to know about your answer to this question too, Oscar. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you mm-hmm. think of wedding the practical and the intellectual life and for and do you think that you and potentially Oldham Oldham you can speak to this too are sacrificing the purely intellectual life in order to embody a thought in reality or to bring some about Mm -hmm. to manifest something like virtue in the world um and yeah yes i i think my uh, immediate answer would have to be yes i currently (laughs) I'm having to sacrifice the purely intellectual life um, in order to be able to run a school, for example. And um, it's it's a heavy duty job where you're um, constantly being uh, pulled in in many different directions, um, not only as to the operations of the school, um, the hiring of new staff, the uh, keeping teachers accountable, coaching teachers, uh, discipline with students, meeting with parents, um, making apologies. Uh, it, you know, there's just so many things that happen in the steering of a ship of a school that there's very little time at the end of the day to be able to pursue an in, the intellectual life uh, in the way that a hermit would or in the way that a researcher at a, an Ivy League school would, right? <clears throat> so I, I have to make the extra effort to wake an hour or two earlier than everybody else or stay up later than everybody else to read a book. Um, 
And even then, it's not with the same energy that I pursue the, the practical life, which is, again, the running of the school and making sure that it's a place for others to pursue the life of the intellect. So in a, in a strange way, I'm providing to others as a service, you could say it's a service of love, what I would, what I would like for myself, um, in a sense. Um, and, and that, being able to see others pursue what I would desire for myself, which is, I think, um, Aristotle's definition of goodwill towards others, uh, is, gives me some joy. Um, I, would, I would love to be able to live the full intellectual life, <clears throat> but I also know what sacrifices are involved in that pursuit. Uh, think of the tempest, for example. Uh, Prospero loses his kingdom. So th here we see again the difficulty of a leader in having to choose between running the kingdom or pursuing in, 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 a, purely, in a pure way the intellect and abandoning the kingdom. So it seems at least the way that I'm reading the, the texts, both these texts, uh, it seems like it is an impossibility. Uh, I might be wrong. Maybe someone has achieved it in the past. It looks like Caesar chose <laughs> his path and it was not the intellectual life um, to the extent that, again, that a philosopher would have pursued the intellectual life. Did that, does that answer your question? It, it does. It makes me want to ask you both this question then. Uh, what is it about the purely intellectual life that makes that you long for um, or that you would long for too, Oldham? Because I was asking you the question last time we spoke about why it is that you enjoy thinking and, with these students all day. On, so like a philosophy Friday mm -hmm. being like a good day for you. And you said it's the best thing to do. Yeah. And yeah, so the best. What, is, what is it? about the so we all went to st john's and we're all familiar with spending lots of time on the lawn or library or various coffee shops reading ancient texts and loving it more than anything and then conversing yes. about it and loving that and loving sharing the life of the mind but what is it about the life of the mind precisely that is so such a powerful draw that it, you know you 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 would prefer to do that to what it is you're doing but so believe in what you're doing that you do that instead. Mm. Who, who, is that? Which, who? Which one of us? <laughs> Go for it, Oldham. Um, I think my answer for that would have to be uh, something in the, in in, reflective of what I guess Socrates or Plato would would be inclined to say. It's it's like. When, when, when you dwell in those, the universals, when you start talking about those truths, it's like you're participating in, um, in something above uh, just regular existence. You're, you're dealing in the things that um, uh, far precede us and outlast us and, that, and yet are part of us in, um, in everyone in the world in ways that we don't realize unless we think about them. And to not only read a book and communicate with an author on those ideas, but to share in that and your experience with other living human beings. It's, it's, I mean, you're dwelling in the world of the divine when you do that. And how can that not be the greatest thing? Mm -hmm. I, I think of a good image uh, to express this feeling um, or this ethereal uh, experience mm -hmm. uh, is the image of baptism. Uh, there's this beautiful mm -hmm. folk song that, um, I was just sharing with my, my new family, my, my new community here of, of parents at the school that I'm working at. And it's a song that we sing with my children and it's, uh, it's called Down to the River to Pray. So it's, a, it's a, mm. an Appalachian classic. And it's, it's just, it's a return. Every time you return to what Oldham is describing as the universals, it's a return to that fountain. To that fount of life, right? It's it's a it's a return to your being baptized once again. Um, and to me, it's a return to the first time I encountered the universals, if you will, which is when I was a child and uh, I had picked up a book of uh, medieval uh, art, and I had seen for the very first time in Honduras when I was 
right? Um, had never been exposed to these ideas. Um, I saw pictures of knights and dragons, and I saw pictures of brave heroes. And as a young, as a young boy with a with the heart of a boy, I felt ennobled. I felt that I felt elevated. I, I for the first time I felt that there was hope outside of my immediate circumstances. So it's a return to that, uh, mm. right? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit, if you will. <laughs> yeah, and, and just in different language, but I think saying the same thing, it's almost right. as if what you do as you ingest uh, these great books and these works of literature and philosophy and sort of observe the structure of the cosmos is you sort of update your system. You, you, you yeah. imbibe more information and are thus made renewed through mm. this intake of manna, you you literally give yourself the stuff that gets the the river of thought moving again in order to update your map of how things are, right? Because it, it generally happens yep. to me that after you really read one of these texts or think it through, that you have new perspective. You have a yep. new way of looking at things that takes you out of the rut you had been in. That's ultimately, I think, what we're looking for in this. And, uh, yeah. I heard you saying, yeah, all of them. Go ahead. I mean, the, the perfect Wait, what? Um, in addition to baptism, you were talking about manna. It's, it's, it's a form of the Eucharist, if you will. It's, it's the participating at the, at the Lord's Supper where you um, ingest is the word you use, but when you become one with the divine, uh, I think is another form that Oldham was pointing out. Um, mm. it, it, it's a way of nourishing. Uh, nourishing yourself um, and I think that's why it's not only appealing to uh, a man of a religious disposition as myself but also uh, agnostics atheists I think that this is an, um, a human experience that is universal um, and I've with the atheists that I've had these conversations with they would agree that when they read say the life of Caesar uh, their heart is moved uh, their 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 passions are um, aflame once again for heroic and virtuous action, for adventure, uh, mm. for behaving well and doing good, uh, for saving the world. There seems to be um, something in the heart of man that wants that. Um, uh, but I think I did, uh, did I cut you off, Oldham? No, no, no. That was, I really like what you guys are talking about. That's, these are really good points. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I heard you saying, yeah, Oldham. So I was wondering what exactly you were agreeing to and what I was saying and what it was that you felt about this. I know you said that you were agreeing, but yeah, what specifically? Yeah, um, I, I, I really like the the religious symbolism that Oscar's bringing in. Um, I, I remember being back in undergrad and trying to kind of realize that one of my purposes was to see the world the way God does. You know, whatever that means for whatever belief system, I think that whatever we can imagine God or a God seeing the world and the universe as it's a lot bigger picture than we little mere humans have. But when you can see the world through the eyes of Caesar by reading the Gallic Wars, or you can, you know, read these stories of these entire people's entire lives. Like you inevitably, it's like you, you live a small life, right? And you live some aspect of the greatness, even if it's only for five minutes reading a chapter from Plutarch or you know an hour a day and and each time we do that we live you know more than our own life and in that way we become more divine because we're more like god whatever god may be and so that's very interesting because you're helping me to understand the distinction between living the divine or godly life in terms of trying to be purely uh spiritual angelic or intelligent but you're also showing me the sort of christian message which is to bring that which is divine or that which is purely intellectual down into the body in a way that mm -hmm. has to be embodied mm -hmm. in a way that will eventually die. And so mm -hmm. you're try you're, mm -hmm. you two are starting to show me not only through your actions, but your words and your choice of words mm -hmm. that it seems like why you, even though both of you are highly intellectual, you, you aren't sitting in libraries all day, either of you. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you'd both right. very much love that. If you were, especially if you had a couple good friends around you all the time to do it. And we have done that before, and that is a good time. Um, the dream. <laughs> but but that the reason you you want to disseminate your knowledge, mm -hmm. that you wish to mm -hmm. sow it to to work the fields, is that you don't get true greatness 
without putting your feet on the ground and making some tread on the earth beneath you. Um, yes. Uh, yes, and if yeah. I might may tie that, uh, Alex, with something that uh, Oldham or, or David said earlier, um, which uh, I find interesting is, and, and I guess it answers my, my original question, which was, what is it about Caesar that we find so great? And I think that um, what it is, is if God were embodied, if God were human, uh, he would be a God of action. And what we're, what, we're, what we're seeing in Caesar or what we're seeing in Alexander the Great or any of the other heroes is that action that inspires us so much that we can live through. So in a sense, we're seeing God-like behavior. Um, and that's what's so drawing to the heart. So in not only are we nourishing our intellect, say, by studying Euclid or by uh, studying Aristotle and the great philosophers or Isaac Newton or uh, Albert Einstein, but we're also uh, nourishing our heart and our characters when we can see in the flesh what godlike behavior looks like. And um, that's a little hard to separate from human error and flaws. So, uh, and mm -hmm. we all admit that Caesar wasn't perfect, but there are those flashes where Caesar is just beyond human. He transcends his own body, um, it, so to speak, by using his body, strangely enough, right, uh, in his actions. And, and I think that um, I really like that David pointed that out, which is I read, for example, the life of Caesar because I can live vicariously through him and become like gods uh, in learning by learning uh, through imitating. And that's, I really like that. And that kind of leads me to, I was asking Oscar the same sort of question. I think that you were at the beginning of whether or not Caesar is, you know, a, you know, a great, I mean, he's definitely a great man, but you know, is he good? Will we quantify him or qualify him as good, great, or just powerful, great. But w there are so many examples of him doing things that are, I think, good, great, like beneficial. Um, like the instance, we all read the same text, um, the the one where the part where he goes to stay, with a couple other people in the the there, a storm hits and they have to stay in a poor man's one hut, you know it was got room in it and um, he said uh, he said something like that um, honors have to be given to the strongest but necessities go to the weakest and it, there was one amongst them who was like sick or not doing well and they said you stay inside we'll sleep out on the porch basically and. I thought that was really, really indicative of his character. Like when nobody else was around, um, that's the sort of thing that he did. And that's, you know, giving honors to the strongest, but necessities to the weakest, I think is some, a good method to live by as well. I agree. And I see, I see also in him, uh, like you're saying, Oscar, the sort of the purely divine nature as well as the human nature like the, the Theodicus images with half half of Jesus's face sort of looking human and evil and half looking sort of pure. But like he is so often manifesting the spirit of his times and like a God moving and changing the world around him while at the same time also, of course, uh, having the flaws of man and being himself arrogant and Tower of Babel-like at times yeah. um, and, and, you know, taking too much, sort of in embracing hubris but embracing hubris in the same way that a giant like a god does um and so so just uh i just i don't think that his humanity is a mark against him because like you said it is like he is a full embodiment of a god rather than simply the highest faculty of a god as aristotle or aquinas would say the intellect that he embodies the will the most uh, which is what Dante says it's the most divine element of man, that the intellect, though highest, like the highest angel of God, like Lucifer, is the highest faculty of man and most divine in that respect, but it, that it was produced for willpower to exist so that man could be free like God. That's Dante's claim. And what this man illustrates, I think, is maximal freedom and action in the world. He does what he wants, and I think, like you say, Oldham, it often serves the good as well as yeah. the great, the human, you know, civic good, as well as sort of like the profoundly divine and powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, you no, know, cer certainly. And I think it was uh, 
uh, Socrates, uh, I was reading, it was either in the Republic or uh, one of his other dialogues, I can't remember, uh, one of Plato's di Plato dialogues, but it was Socrates who um, really uh, left, a, left a mark, in, at least in my, in my mind, when he, he pointed out how it was the despot, right? The man of extremes, the man of, of, of lavish heart or uh, great will that could do the greatest good or the greatest evil. Whereas the mediocre man or the democratic man or the man who has very, um, <laughs> very weak passions, if you will, will uh, not the megalosuchia. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Correct. Um, and in that respect, I, I, I see what you're saying, um, Alex. I see a man in Caesar who is at both extremes. He can do the greatest good and we admire him for it. And he can do the greatest evil, and we admire him for the force of will. Um, we we are a judgmental, and I don't think this is any different from other generations. We look on the past and we judge it, and we judge it according to our own mores. And and I think that we can look back and say, well, Caesar uh, did use this maximum extent of his will, that which is which is admirable in itself. Uh, to do some atrocious things that uh, we don't wish for our sons to imitate. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Well, to whatever extent we think what he did was atrocious. <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> some of the things he did, like denying the Gauls uh, the chance to move across Roman territory in order mm -hmm. to avenge a Roman military defeat at the Gauls' expense, or, mm -hmm. or at, uh, at the Gauls' hands from 30 right. years or can seem like a bully move or stud move, sort of how we defend, we think about it. The fact that he had, I yeah. think, what, four wives during the course of his life, we can see that uh, in many ways as well. And the fact that he had a child by, say, Cleopatra, is it's mm -hmm. hard for me to define whether, you know, I judge him in a conventional way about that sort of thing, given, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the figure that Cleopatra is in the history and mythology of, you know, the West. It's, it's just... Mm -hmm. He, he truly does seem to be a figure that defines morality in many ways and uh, casts a certain type that is not the average, like you said. It's like, it's like economies of scale with him. You have to judge him by what he is rather than by uh, you know, our own potentially mediocre or mediocritizing or democratizing standards. Because I think even his time attempted to do that, right? To deny him what was his. And you know, even though he was killed, ultimately he was not killed. He was deified, mm -hmm. um, like yep. like Heracles. And so, you know, and the men and Plutarch goes to great pains to show how the men who betrayed him died before ending his life, indicating that his influence, like Jesus's, went from continued from beyond the grave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, certainly. I mean, I read Plutarch a little more as he's ambivalent about Caesar himself, um, for sure. He, very objective. I mean, I, I, I love Plutarch for this reason. Um, and what, in his other lives, he seems a little more gung-ho about some of his heroes. But with Caesar, he doesn't seem to want to side on one, on one way or another about him. He'll point out, for example, that Sulla, Sulla the dictator prior to Caesar, in Caesar's young life, uh, wanted to kill Caesar. And um, a lot of Caesar's friends and a lot of Sulla's friends who were all connected uh, stopped him from doing that and said, don't kill Caesar. He's just an 18 year old. Why would you, um, why would you waste your energies on a young man? And Sulla's words were in him. I see many Mariuses. And then it depends on the yes. translation. You're reading, right. In, he said, you'll regret this because in him, I see a thousand Mariuses. And um, just for, for this, for our readers who are not familiar with Marius, Marius was Sulla's arch enemy. I mean, these were two also great figures at the time who had uh, put the entire, uh, what was at the time, the Republic, the Roman Republic, into turmoil, right, over a power struggle. Uh, so there was something already that was evident in Caesar that even the men of his time felt was a danger or a threat to the Republic. Uh, Plutarch also mentions how Cicero, had, could see, for example, that Caesar was a man full of ambition and desirous of power. 
Uh, but then how how Caesar in in a, in a boyish way, which is very interesting, how Caesar is described. Uh, he has this boyish boyish quality of uh, parting his hair and playing with his hair. Sometimes it just win, wins people over apparently, <laughs> uh, which is just awkward. It's just <laughs> odd to think about. Um, it, again, <laughs> he is already from such a young age um, regarded as a, a protege, right? He's he's brilliant, he's lovable, he wins people over. Uh, he he sets apparently he sets. Uh, the standard for fashion, just as much as for behavior at the time. He's a party animal in his young age. Um, uh, he sleeps around with a lot of uh, uh, politicians' wives. Um, and, and then there's this really there's this soft side about him where he's merciful, which is very unique for men of his time. He's kind. He shows humanity. He knows how to lead his men by actually getting his hands dirty and getting down with them and working with them in the trenches. Uh, he, he's not afraid of showing that he can work as equals with his own soldiers. I, I, David's example is a good one. He'll give the place of comfort to one of his six, six soldiers as opposed to uh, taking it for himself. He sleeps outside of the shed under the rain with his own men. I mean, this this is remarkable for a leader of his own time. It, it, it's unheard of. I don't I don't know of any other leader that that does this uh, in the way that Caesar does. All right. So then I have a big question for both of you again, starting with Oldham. Um, mm -hmm. To what extent, a, do you agree that to become a great man or a great person, one needs a great deed or a great opponent or a great problem to solve? And that for Caesar, to some extent, that great problem was Pompeius Magnus, Pompey the Great, and that he defeated him. And that supposedly he wept at the news of yeah. Pompey's death yeah. and said something to the effect that, you know, the, the man who was spoken of was much greater than the man speaking to him who reported that or something along that lines or those mm -hmm. lines. And so if we take that seriously, and I take seriously your two uh, aspiring towards civic virtue and greatness. What is your great problem that you are sort of devoting yourself to, Oldham, that you have been sort of uh, focusing in on? What it, if, if you are Caesar, who is your Pompeii? And how, mm. how, how do you mobilize against it? That's a, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think insofar as we're human beings active in the world, if you're going to pursue anything but uh, complacency, you you have to act. Like, that's that's the only way to truly, you know, you could be great all day long, but unless you act on it or you show it, you, there's no way of embodying it, no way of bringing it out into the world. And I think that, yeah, Pompey was definitely that for Caesar. Um, I mean, if it hadn't been for Pompey, you know, it wouldn't have had to have marched on Rome. And if, if we've not, um, if Pompey had not been, you know, assassinated, we wouldn't see that, have the opportunity to see that part of Caesar that, like you said, like he wept, you know, and then he went on to have the assassins killed, if I remember correctly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very intense, especially because there's that relationship with them. Like there's human aspect, you know, he had his, his daughter, uh, Mary Pompey. And, and so there's that, it's like a brotherly relationship there, even though they were like the epitome of enemies at the end. Um, and so I think that's how we have to approach our understanding of any um, thing that we attempt to tackle, that it's the, the greater obstacles are going to be the ones that are the most dear to us. And I, I think I'm still very much trying to find that. I know that it's somewhere in the law. Um, and I might not, you know, maybe I'll find it in my first year. Maybe I'll find it, you know, in a decade or two. But um, I, I suppose I'm, I'm looking for it. Um, and it's, for a great part of my life, it's been education. You know, it's been attempting to open these children's mind up to the idea of what philosophy is to open their hearts up to the possibility of wisdom just to show them that hey you know it doesn't matter what your background is like this is a possibility and it's in a way your duty as a human being with a 
prefrontal cortex, but, um, (laughs) (laughs) and as far as I'm trying to go about it with, with the law, I'm, I guess I'm trying to find out what that is. I don't know if it's, you know, going to be something with like, it could be anywhere from civil rights to criminal law to, uh, I don't know, judicial procedure. I have, I have no idea, (laughs) but I, I, maybe hopefully I could tell myself I'm a little bit like Caesar in the, but, uh, you know, he he felt what he had to do. He he knew when the military called to him. He knew what he, he the direction he needed to go. I just hope that I can be um, as uh, um, strong in the face of adversity as as he was in his many situations, mm-hmm. and hopefully come out close to as you know victorious with whatever, whatever little um, problems I face and obstacles. I- yeah, um, David, it could act, it could also be one of us. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it, right? Uh, so well, you have our own triumvirate. <laughs> well, we have the triumvirate right <laughs> here. <laughs> Three of us already together, and and that's what's so tragic. Right. At least I read it. Yeah. When I read it, I read it from a from a tragic point of view. Um, mm-hmm. uh, Caesar seems to want to avoid this outcome from the start. I mean, he marries his yeah. daughter to Pompey. He, he wants to create a relationship. He wants to resolve issues. He's always seeking for the, non, uh, the least aggressive or the nonviolent way out. I, right. I, don't know, I don't know how long he can really keep that up, given his ambition. <laughs> He's going to have to get rid of Pompey. Um, but uh, it, it, it's one of, the, one of the men closest to him, one of the men who actually took him under his wing um, and from which he learned a lot. So it's, um, it's really tragic to see that when Caesar comes of age and realizes that he's met the only other match who is someone he's grown to love, hmm. someone who is the uh, father of his grandchild, right? So this is a, an important point, um, who, who eventually dies. So the child doesn't live long enough uh, for, there to actually, for that unity to actually stick. Um, but there is, I mean, and it's, it's, just, it's just amazing to me. It's dumbfounding. Here we have Caesar having to make a choice, and he'll make the choice that will make him, in the end, the one guy on top of all the others. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, to me, the Rubicon is nothing compared to actually having to fight Pompey. It seems to be the, see, seems to be the sacred Rubicon that he has to cross when he has to uh, dispose of his own friend. Uh-huh. And, the, and and just a very Sith Lord Star Wars like aspect. It, <laughs> it just remind me that it happens to be somebody deeply close to him who is his younger mm-hmm. that ends up taking him out. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, of course, Brutus and Cassius himself not being um, so far from his heart, from what I recall. Though though it is said in both the Shakespeare version of Caesar as well as Plutarch that he is he is known to have made some comment, perhaps apocryphal, about. Uh, not caring for the uh, the ambitious looking pale and skinny men and but <laughs> Oscar I want to know I want to know your answer to this question I thought uh, you know you gave a fine answer Oldham that was a that was a wonderful answer oh, Oscar I'm very interested in a whether you agree that it is the great task that brings greatness out of a man in that Greatness does not come without great responsibility being taken and potentially great, you know, sort of risk. But also, what, what is it that you're, are you staking your claim on something and what is it, if so? Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I take the point of view of uh, Herodotus in, in, this, uh, in this respect, which is... Naturally. <laughs> Naturally, that's right. <laughs> well, let me explain that. <laughs> Uh, which is uh, call no man happy until he's dead. And uh, I think it very much applies Mm -hmm. to the concept of greatness. Call no man great until he has finished his life in greatness um, and has not died an ignoble death. So uh, I think that Caesar um, dies a successful uh, death, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, for the reason that uh, not only did he had, it wasn't one great obstacle that he had to fight but it was many small ones that we know him by and it's the reason why we have his a biography of his since he was young where we can see his character 
again, I think the key here is character. Uh, we see greatness in his character when he decides to leave Rome because his life is in danger, or when he enrolls in the school of Apollonius to learn rhetoric, or when he's taken, uh, kidnapped by the pirates, and his, his um, behavior or response to that, and uh, so on and so forth until the end of his life. Um, I think that Caesar, what makes him, in my opinion, great is that he does not go, uh, he doesn't necessarily look for these trials, but they seem made fit for his character, um, which brings in the element of fate, which is very strange. Uh, Caesar, to me, seems like the kind of character that is fictional for the reason that the trials that he faces and the degree to which he has impacted history seems yeah. so fantastic that there must be some other form of influence or some kind, at least from the way I read it, um, some kind of divine element at work in this man's life. Because uh, it's just the, the, the pieces of the puzzle fit so perfectly with each other, even and in the way that events occur in his life. Um, that is just well, so remarkable. Yeah, and three things about that is, A, he dies exactly as he wants to, right? When he asked how he wants to die, it's suddenly. So even his death is to some extent subject to his will yes. and yes. does work in his favor, making him out to be divine. And Dante's eighth circle of heaven is the constellations. And what a constellation is, is a form revealed by particular points within it. So mm -hmm. like the path of your life is drawn out by your actions. And mm -hmm. so... That is precisely the best way by this reasoning to judge Caesar from top to bottom, from beginning to end. This is the figure that he cut in reality. Yes. And that what is better than to have been born in greatness and also been bathed in it during his life due you know, to the perfection of his excellent qualities mm -hmm. and his uh, his public spiritedness, um, because mm -hmm. he, even when he died, the public found out, and this is one of the things that turned them against his conspirators, which is just an ultimate like Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone act against Marv and the other, <laughs> uh, and Joe Pesci, whatever his <laughs> character's name is there. But like he gave out uh, from his own wealth and the wealth uh, that he accumulated from his his victories back mm. to the people to each person and yeah. um it, <clears throat> i do not know a better or ba a better way to judge him based on uh mm. the uh, the herodotus definition of of life you know call no man happy until he's dead and your riff on it call no man great until he's dead it's like mm -hmm. at what moment was he not great mm -hmm. and um yeah. the reason i'm i harp on that um I guess, Herodotian principle so much, especially with my students, is um, I've noticed there's a tendency in young people today to be on the constant lookout for that great moment. And they overlook the immediate yes. moment. And yes. um, there, there is an example. We, we read this with our students also at school, which is the Great Gatsby. I think he's an inverted form of Caesar. Um, where we have a very similar upbringing as Caesar's. It's not a, it's not a very noble, he has a noble name to him, but uh, he, he's not rich by any means. Family has somewhat of a bad reputation. Um, but the, the main character of the Great Gatsby is always looking at, he has a sense of greatness of himself, but is always looking at that moment in the future and then dies, an, or you could say dies an ignoble death. There's no, uh, no lasting patrimony, no lasting legacy, if you will. Uh, whereas Caesar, every single moment is a moment that's worth capturing. We want to remember every, every one of his words. We, we want to emulate every one of his actions because even in the smallest things, this man is so admirable. Um, I mean, even Jesus spoke his name. <laughs> and yeah, you, you know that's in the red letter versions. Give unto Caesar. That's what a good point. <laughs> and uh, you know that's that's quite the distinction. <laughs> but one thing about him, you were saying it's opposite how Jay Gatsby grew up poor because of because in the pirate story, I seem to recall that Julius Caesar is exorbitantly wealthy. 
um, um, though he does come to be far more than he is born as, which is pretty incredible given how much he was born as. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, because he lost his inheritance, right? For, uh, the a lot of it, right? Didn't he? When he was marked well, I, I, under Sola. Yeah, I, I could um, I could be wrong about this, but I, uh, from what I recall, not from Plutarch's life, but uh, Caesar's family had some financial difficulties. At, oh, at the really? Time. Very, okay. very young boy. So he grew up in the part of the city that was known more, uh, what we would, um, what we would consider today kind of the red zone, where you have brothels. So he grew up around brothels and uh, around the round the wrong people. Um, but that mm. kind of from a young age made him very personable because he could relate to all types mm. of people from a young age. He wasn't afraid to mingle with the, the lowly and then to, he knew how to behave with the rich, right? And, and the nobles uh, because, of he, because of his name. His name had a, a noble, um, mm. he had a noble patrimony um, mm. behind him. So, uh, yeah, his connections, I think. I'm, I'm not quite sure okay. what the, how the economy worked back then. but Y'all are helping me. Y'all are helping me. I just have the Plutarch, and so I have much to learn about Caesar. And I know there are volumes. Oh, same here. <laughs> but, but what you make me think, and this was the third point that I failed to make earlier, was about Caesar's connection to Alexander and how you say something about him is that he is so much more fictional-seeming than a fictional character and that he's such a giant amongst men. And that's a claim made about Alexander that had Agamemnon and Achilleus of the Iliad been fused together, they would have been unbelievable. And yet that's what Alexander was. And yes. so I suggest, I, I suppose what I'm getting at is, shall, should we read the life of Alexander, the one paralleled to Caesar for next time and uh, see <laughs> what parallels we can make between you two and and. Uh, him and uh you know i don't you know just because this has been very nice and very good and you know if we're going to see yin we should see yang and we should always do mm. and finish what we start uh given how civic we want to be and mm. i don't know i think it would be good fun and i don't think i've ever read the whole thing or it's been many years since i've read the life of alexander and he is my namesake so you know game on mm. absolutely yeah. i'm up for it yeah. So, and there's, there's another point there. I, I don't know where it's, this is just a story I remember hearing, but the, the one where Alex, he, Alexander's like looking up at the stars or something. And he says, all those worlds out there and I've not even conquered one. And he like comes to tears <laughs> because I don't know where that's written, but I find that an interesting parallel to the one of Caesar looking at Alexander. He's like, Oh, look what he did by the time he's my age. And it's just, nobody's ever happy who are great. <laughs> Well, you know, and I think just, you know, he is also one of those quotable figures, like his approach to the Gordian, not according to some, some mm -hmm. sources, or that he just walked up to it and cut it in half. And that is the practical approach, you know, <laughs> who, care, who cares how you do it cerebrally if you can do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you can walk the walk, talking the talk is a far cry from necessary. It's secondary. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And even though that happens to be what our walk is, we, mm -hmm. <laughs> you're as teachers with our feet on the ground, we walk and talk at the same time. We're very <laughs> um, peripatetic in that respect. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Well, um, what should we, uh, Oscar, what should we end on? Do we have a closing thought? Do we want to leave the listeners with a question? Do we want to, um, uh, tell them tell them any or do we want to wish oldham goodbye oldham it's been great having you i hope that you can i appreciate it yeah. uh, well there is uh, one little um detail that plutarch kind of glosses over really quickly but i thought was very interesting that i think might be a good thing to to end on and and uh your thoughts would uh, great to hear on this but there is that moment in caesar's life that i think uh really characterizes the entirety of his life and it is a moment that we all share as humans and it's a moment when we need to make a decision many of us will choose the safe route many of us will choose to be conservative whereas caesar was willing to take risks and uh it's the it's the part when caesar returns from fighting the gauls 
and he's waiting outside of the city. And the Senate and the people of the city have decided to throw a triumph for him. Now, a triumph, if I understand that correctly, is very rare. It's an honor that is given to very few people over the course of centuries in the history of Rome. So this is one of the greatest honors anyone can get in their lifetime. And Caesar has to choose whether he's going to accept that honor or, or he's going to run for the consulship. And he has a dilemma here because according to the laws of Rome, if you go into the city before you're granted the honor, then you lose it. But if Caesar doesn't go into the city before the vote is cast, he won't be made a consul. So he needs to choose then and there what he's going to go for. And he chooses to not take the triumph mm -hmm. and win the consulship by winning the votes of the people. That is a remarkable risk. That is, to me, it shows that Caesar is looking for something greater than just a triumph, which is, we remember people by triumphs. Triumphs are huge things. Um, but that, that to me shows that Caesar was willing to risk everything. He, he was a gambler when it came to his own life. Um, and that is always, uh, to me at least, is a, it's a clarion call to the kind of life I would love to live, uh, but might not have the guts that Caesar did. <laughs> well, that's precisely it about Caesar, right? Yes. That he's the man that turned down the triumph. And that's the difference between him and Jay Gatsby. Jay Gatsby tries to conquer the past, which is impossible, which is like mm -hmm. trying to revive the dead, whereas Caesar wants to conquer the present and the future. And that's certainly what he's done. Yes. Like we still speak of Roman Catholics. Uh, and again, you know, Caesar's name is, you know, to this day, a German word for King Kaiser. Um, yes. And uh, see, yeah. So. Yes, I, I think, think with that, that is eternity as opposed to just, you know, that temporal glory. He chooses eternity, which is uh, for mm -hmm. a temporal man himself. But a great degree of insight and or foresight. Well, and it just reminds me of a mythological story. And uh, I think Plato brings this up too. And I, I can't recall whether it's the Phaedrus or an, another piece, but he says that it is the highest glory to be given a seat mm -hmm. at the table of the gods, which I would take the triumph to be represented by, but even more glory to pass yes. on the food of the gods to the mm -hmm. next or to take the seat out, which is what I take it, uh, which is how I understand what you believe, what you're saying you're doing, Oscar, that you're, you're creating that place at the table for someone else to yes. sit in mm -hmm. um, so that, you know, so that, you know, you can have a role in creating the king rather than, mm -hmm. or creating the philosopher. And in some way, I don't know, is that an even higher calling to be the demiurge of something greater than oneself? Hmm. Um, or is that the ultimate act of teaching uh, or fatherhood? I suppose these, these are big questions that I have, but that is what Caesar's action reminds me of, hmm. that he, he is the man that turns down the triumph. He turns down the lure of the past or past glory in order to live in the present to conquer the future. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. And well, guys, <laughs> on to Alexander then next time. That's right. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. We got to hit that. We got to hit that Quintus, that five. So this has been <laughs> the Great Men Podcast for and well, good night, gentlemen. Thank you so much, Alex. Hey, David, it was so good talking. Uh, have a good evening. Yeah, it's good to hear from you after a number of years. Good to talk to you guys. Look forward to the next one. Yeah. Looking forward to the next one. It won't be a number of years, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, see you guys. Have a good evening, guys.